to the Zorge Podcast, Conversations with Legends and Leaders. I am Chris Zorge, and on today's show, we have a person who covers both categories, legends and leaders. A Notre Dame double domer, a lot of folks don't understand what that is, but we can kind of get into that. Angel Investor, VP of Global Marketing for the Obama Energy Corporation, five-year NFL alum, president of the Chicago NFL Alumni Association, and probably most importantly, a member of the NFL Fashion Police, which we'll have a chance to talk about. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Corey Mays. Oh, and I forgot, fellow Chicagoan, right? Yes, absolutely. What's up, Chris? It's great I, to be here. Absolutely, man. This, this is going to be a lot so of fun, man. <laughs> I feel so honored. Well, here's the amazing part is, and we're going to talk about this, but Corey has done everything that you're supposed to do, right? As an athlete, um, he's taken full advantage of his college experience, but more importantly, also of his NFL experience. Uh, went back to school at Notre Dame, uh, got his MBA, we're, we're, we're also gonna talk about that, but I think it's amazing, you're an amazing example for current student athletes, but more importantly for us older guys too, as kind of the, the 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 right way you're supposed to do things. So I do appreciate all that you've done. Oh wow, I needed that ego stroke today. It's been a rough <laughs> week. You know, I needed that I'm, one. Sorry, I feel good. Me. I'm right. I'm right back in the saddle, baby. I'm ready. I'm good to go. <laughs> no, well, but it's true. You know, and oftentimes when you're kind of in the middle of it, you know, you don't think about it. Um, yeah. And sometimes you need that little push. So, you know, absolutely, man. I will be your hype man. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, I want to get, we can talk a little bit about kind of the Chicago connection. Talk to us a little bit about your born and raised in Chicago, South Side, went to Morgan Park, um, and I'm doing a little research. I think they call it the Morgan Park now. The wow. Morgan Park. So it's kind of like the Ohio State. <laughs> wow. That's okay. All right. Did you guys win a couple state championships in basketball? And all of a sudden now you guys are the Morgan It's different. Park. Different. You know, it's different now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit because I mean that school is one of the kind of gems, one of the hidden gems on the south side of Chicago. So kind of talk a little bit about kind of growing up in Chicago, but also kind of your involvement with sports and again, doing a couple, little, little research, found out you actually didn't play football to your freshman year in high school. So can you talk, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, my, I didn't play to my freshman year of high school. And I'll tell you what, that first hour of my first practice, and you know, I get there for two days for, for training camp <laughs> and everything. And, you know, I asked one of the other freshmen, I'm like, are they, you know, is everybody fully dressed downstairs? Does everybody have all the pads on? It's my first time getting all the pads. And, uh, you know, he kind of said, uh, yeah. So uh, that was lesson number one. I'll trust but verify. So, you know, <laughs> I put on everything, put on, you know, all the pads and everything. And then we're supposed to go down and take run two laps around the school. That's like it's like two miles running around that school. So, you know, after two after those two laps, I run into the field to where I think the freshmen are. I run into the field where varsity is stretching. Right. And all the coaches wow. are there. And I looked and the first thing I first thing that happens, I run into that field and the coaches are just screaming and yelling and the players are laughing. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Coaches cussing me out saying, you look like you got hit by a bus. And then oh my so God. I didn't know that the pockets had uh, pockets in them for the pads. The, okay. the pants okay. had pockets. Okay. So I just I just thought. You know, the pads will stay in place because the pants oh are tight. God, and really? so the pads are all over the place. <laughs> I mean, varsity, everybody is there. And I mean, it's just and this is the first hour, the first day of my first practice ever. You know, so, you know, it's just one of those life lessons. If you <laughs> it isn't how you start, it's how you finish. And if I had oh let gosh. that experience deter me, it's no matter. It's, it's no telling where my life sure. might have led after that. You know, sure. so it's. It's it, it was an incredible experience to start off. So I know you have an older brother, right? I have uh, three older brothers. Okay, did they participate in athletics at, at any point, or were you the only one? 
Uh, my second oldest, uh, he's closest to me. He he played football, but that was you know in like elementary school. So okay. he didn't play in high school, but that's kind of what sparked me okay. watching them going out to practices and watching them play. And then my oldest oldest brother, he played baseball okay. uh, in college, but um, that was pretty much it. You know, nice. it was just really playing around the neighborhood, playing killer man. You know, throwing the wow. ball up in the air, catching it, and see who. Who can make it to the other gate and back? Sure, you know? absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting to kind of find out kind of how kind of folks got started, right? Because yeah, you think about kind of the end result, and the the end result in your case was the NFL, but you know people really don't understand that journey, and people just assume that you've been playing since you were you know you could put pads on, and yeah. oftentimes it's not even like that. No, it's not. I mean, you think about it, it's it's a nine year journey and not too many people would sign up for that uh, here. <laughs> do something for nine years with no guarantee of employment behind it. You know, right. most people would say, no, I'm not doing that. You know, there's nothing guaranteed behind it. So for me, it was really it was, it was just dedication coming back every day, coming back, you know, no matter the disappointment, no matter the, you know, how high it got, no matter how low it got, you know, let's just come back the next day and let's continue to work. You know, and that I, is fabulous. You know, and that's all you can do. There's so much other stuff you can't control in life. That's all you can do is just show up every day. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, and I'm a little biased, but when you think about the lessons that football teaches us, yeah, it's a lot different than basketball, baseball, volleyball. I mean, any other sport you look at, not too many times you get the crap beat out of you. <laughs> and on one play and then have to come back like on the next play and possibly break a touchdown or throw a touchdown. Oh, pass yeah. Or make a tackle, you got make a sack. you got 30 seconds uh, on average, probably to get your mind together, you know, to either forget what happened or just to gear yourself back up. So it's quick. The turnaround is quick. All right. So <laughs> when you were being recruited, was Notre Dame always in the picture or, you know, what, what schools were you looking at? Well, Notre Dame was always in the picture. I remember, you know, being a little kid watching, you know, Notre Dame games coming up and there was this, this big guy from Chicago. He had his abs <laughs> out, you know, I'm like, wow. And my brother yeah. said, well, you better start eating if you want to get to that <laughs> level. But, you know, I mean, you know, it was the 90s. So, I mean, especially the late 90s. So, you had, you know, Miami, the Florida States, Nebraska, Michigan, you know, all those teams were always, you know, on my radar, you know, because it was college football was just peak. You know, sure. you just think about the 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 neck rolls, six feet tall off of the off the players' necks and, Absolutely. you know, the visors and the movie, the program. And I mean, that pretty much there just, you go. just <laughs> ruined us all. I mean, we, we would watch that, you know, every every um, night game that we had in high school. We would watch that before the game. So, I mean, that's that was our vision of college football. Just, you know, just gritty, just get after it. You know, and that that was my dream to to make it to that to that stage and to that atmosphere. So if it wasn't Notre Dame, where else would, would you have? I mean, what other places were you considering? Uh, Miami, um, it was actually Boston College. I, I like the – see, it was the, it was the academics about it. You know, okay. and then it was, it was Boston. Okay. It was a new city. You know, I'm you know, being from Chicago, you love the city. So it was, that was cool. So it really just kind of came down to a few more, you know, a few schools. And really when it came down to it, the biggest factor about it, because everybody, every coach comes and tells you they love you, that they're, they're calling, they're sending letters, you're going to be great, you're going to be this, you're going to be that. But, you know, I, I remember I took a, a, a visit to Michigan State and the professor said, you know, it's great to meet athletes who speak in complete sentences. And that was pretty like, what? You know, so, I mean, it's, I mean it's, and it's no no knock against Michigan State. Sure. Boo. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just it came down to academics. And I thought about the alumni base. I'm like, well, you get to play on TV every week. And it's, you know, it's 90 minutes from you know, from Chicago, but it felt like a world away. So for me, that's what it really came down to. And I knew I, I took some visits and I had some, uh, a whole lot of fun and a, and a lot of other campuses. 
And I knew that I, I needed a, a stable environment, a quiet, <laughs> stable environment for me. I don't know how I made that decision at 16 years old, but I, I think I knew. I felt like I felt the gravity of the situation and I felt like there was an opportunity there uh, seemingly out of nowhere. Right. Starting from that first day of not knowing there's uh, pockets in the pants to this to this big stage. Now, I feel like this is something for me to protect. And it's uh, you, I think you just got to know yourself. <laughs> well, and, and I've been asking a couple of guys that we've had on the podcast. I mean, I'm assuming your recruiting trip probably ranked out of all the recruiting trips you had probably ranked either the lowest or maybe maybe second to lowest. Is, is that is that a possible? Is that correct? I actually had you fun on my visit. Okay. I had fun on my visit, but and most importantly, I liked the uh, the players on the team. Not to say you know that there, there weren't other players across, with other you know college campuses that I didn't like, but I think you know I felt like everyone just was real. You know, they broke it down. There was no there was no fluff about what things were. You know, I, and I liked that. And I felt like okay, if I came here, I can hang out with these guys. I can build relationships with these guys. And I thought I thought you know that's super important. You know, because it was more than just partying and having a good time because there was a reality of, well, what if there is no party? You know, what what is the the rest of your day look like, you know, every day? Well, that's a very interesting, mature statement. But I know on my visit, it rained, it snowed, it was ridiculous, <laughs> it was nasty. I was talking to some other guys. I mean, they were like, dude, I went to Florida State. Had the best time in the world. I got there. It was snowing. I had never been in snow before. I mean, so <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting how these stories kind of occur and happen. And you can remember, like, I remember my first time there, and it wasn't the best. But then you really kind of make it kind of yeah. the experience that you want. Yeah. It's not a state school to where you're partying and, and doing all this stuff. And, I mean – at least it wasn't that experience for me, you know, <laughs> <to> where, <laughs> and, you know, and I, I didn't drink in college, so I was okay. sober the whole time just watching it, you know, go down. So it was just, it was, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, I still have fun my four years there, you know, and it was th through a lot of trials and tribulations there, but, you know, it's to me, I, you know, I knew the stability was there and I knew that's what I needed. Okay. That's what I needed. You know, it's one of those personal statements. That's what I needed. You know, sure. I can't speak for every, for anyone else. Well, and then, like, I mean, you talk about your family members having a chance to participate in athletics. I mean, how were they during that process for you? Were they excited about, you know, hey, you go to Notre Dame? Or were they saying, hey, you, know, you, you may have an opportunity at Boston College or Miami or where else? I mean, how did they feel about your decision to attend Notre Dame? Uh, everybody was proud. Everybody was happy. Everyone was excited. And I think that was what was most important. I didn't have people saying, well, you should do this or you should do that or a whole bunch of people in my ear. And I think I was lucky from that standpoint. There were a few people around, you know, trying to, you know, wiggle their way in and try to make stuff happen. But it's like, you know, I, I felt like my family was great. My coaches, you know, from high school, my mentors, they were great as far as kind of keeping that blockade around me and keeping me protected and safe. And too often times you see a lot of uh, these high school kids get taken advantage of oh. someone else trying to make a name for themselves and put themselves in a position to where they can possibly, you know, have themselves a little uh, stipend or salary four or five years later, you know, from that kid. So I, I, I'm very eternally grateful for having that, that base around me because I know that's, that's not always uh, the case. Sure. And, and I want to talk a little bit about this because, I mean, I left in 87. You left in 2001. Um, and I don't know how many public school kids. Now, there have been a lot of Chicago kids. You know, know how great you have to be to be mentioned in someone else's commitment? That's just great. Uh, no, please continue. <laughs> Please continue. But but it's it's the idea of, and there are smart kids. I mean, I was in the class with Russell Maryland. But when mm. I say class, I mean eighty seven recruiting yeah. class, and he was at Whitney Young. And so there are talented kids in the public league. Why do you think, and especially kind of Notre Dame is so close? Why do you think there aren't more public league kids going? 
to Notre Dame? I, I, re- I really have no idea. I kind of think it, there might be some disconnect or there might have been a disconnect because there was plenty of talent coming out of the public league. I know it kind of got a a little rap, you know, kind of a bad rap, you know, through the 90s because Chicago really became more of that basketball city, you know, Michael Jordan and the Bulls. And sure. there was such that that fever for that. But there was there was a lot of talent <laughs> in uh in the Chicago public league. And I, I don't know why they didn't go after it. You know, perhaps they felt like they didn't need to, you know, there's always that too, but sometimes things are right there. That's obvious right in your backyard, you know? Well, and that's really the hard part. Cause you think about how a school like Notre Dame can create opportunities for young people in the public league. Right. I mean, yeah. And, and I love my, my, my Catholic League brothers to death. But when you look at the ratio between Catholic League and public league kids going to Notre Dame, it's like it's night and day. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I think, you know, whatever the case may be, I'm not sure. Maybe they, I, I, I have no idea. I can't even answer that. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, kind of like you think of the University of Illinois, how they got away from recruiting right, exactly. uh, the university, oh, like, the, uh, the state of Illinois. Kidding? You know, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to talk a little bit about your journey at Notre Dame. And, and I really feel that the university, the football program, should do something special for the class of 05, which is your class, right? Yeah. Okay. So they need to do something special because folks might not know how many coaches did you have during your four or your three and a half, well, four years at at Notre Dame. Oh, wow. We, who, who, who didn't coach us? So we had, so my freshman year, let, let me break this down. So my freshman year, um, we start 0 and 3, you know, red shirt and oh, and we had 9 11. So that was a whole experience in and of itself. Um, you know, Bob Davey gets fired at the end of the season. Um, we get George O'Leary, he gets hired uh, right before we go on break. Then he gets fired like five days later for lying on his resume. And many of us were recruited to Georgia Tech. So there were freshmen talking about, are we going to transfer? Are we going to like, you know, what is it? Is it going to be, is Mm. it going to be cool that we did go there? You know, whatever the case may be. And then over Christmas break, they hired um, Tyrone Willingham. So we had uh, Willingham for three more years and I, you know, redshirted. So I had a fifth year. So my last year was Charlie Weiss. So, you, you know, I'm I'm very good with change. I'm very good <laughs> with management change. So you throw that at me, I'm going to eat it up and say thank you. Next, let's move on. So I think that was. I really got to see the business side of things. I could imagine. And, how, and, and, and you're you're a teenager at Notre Dame, and then all of a sudden, yeah, I was it's seven, like, seventeen as a freshman. I'm like, come on. what do you do now? You right, know? exactly. I mean, <laughs> you're getting like a, a a crash course in economics as a freshman football player. <laughs> Yeah. Economics, uh, business ethics, <laughs> all, <laughs> all those things, <laughs> you know. So it's it was it was it was something that I'm glad I stuck through uh, because I know, you know, you kind of go through things in life and you you get that reminder of like, look, man, things change. So you have to be ready to adapt and adjust with them. And it won't always be fair, but you you got to work through it because nobody's coming. No one's coming to save you. You know, well, I just kind of live by that <laughs> by that moniker. Corey, I think that's a great point, though. And as a 17-year-old freshman, I mean, I had a coaching change on the professional level, and it was hard. But what do you do? And I kind of want to get down to, like, really the 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 day-to-day feelings. I mean, because, you know, you have this idea of, okay, hey, this is where I'm at in depth chart. You know, I got redshirted. I know if I improve here, if I improve that, that I, hey, I, I know this coach likes me. I yeah. know this coach doesn't like me. Then all of a sudden, it's going. I mean, you're a freshman. You're like, well, do I transfer? Like, what do I do? Yeah, it was. It was hard. It was well. I, I, well, that goes back to recruiting, right? And, you know, and I think it. I mean, life is all conditional. And you know, I had a, a situation in which I I could make a decision on where I wanted to be, and so I knew for the long term. Well, I'm here for the academics. 
uh, granted, you know, you are working is quid pro quo for that scholarship. So you are not going to school for free, ladies and gentlemen. You are not going to school for free. You are working full time. So, you know, it, I, I said, look, I'm I'm going to stick it out. You know, I figure if it's only a year, I need to stick it out. I can't go anywhere. I mean, a couple of people did transfer, but mm -hmm. to me, it wasn't as easy as it was now, you know, with the transfer portal. Right. And I, I just kind of thought in my head, well, where will I go? You know, and that's just kind of the biggest question mark in my head. And I'm like, okay. well, you need to stick this out, you know, for right now and see, you know, what's going on. And I mean, all this transpires within a four to five month period, you know, of having this new coach and everything else, you know, because you, you kind of set your mind up for, you know, all right, this is going to be my these are going to be the staff here, you know, but it's always in the back of your mind that coaches can leave and, and sure. go somewhere or get fired. But sure. I, I certainly wasn't thinking we were going to start <laughs> on three and have a, a season like that, especially after, after, you know, the team going to a, to a bowl game right, uh, right, the exactly. previous year, you know, but, you know, I, I feel like that it was crazy too, because there was so much talent on that team. And I, I do not know how, I mean, with the talent on that team, I mean, it, it would blow, it would blow people away. I just, I don't know. I just, I, I have no idea. There was so much talent on that team, how I did not translate into wins. Well, and that's the interesting thing, and, and, and obviously we're not here to talk about coaching styles or coaches or anything like that, but, I mean, he gets fired. Bob Dib gets fired, then it's – and I don't know how short a period of time it was, but during that time, I mean – and it's a little different because nowadays the athletic director will go and have a team meeting and talk to the team. I mean, did, did that happen with, with Kevin White and you guys? Uh, you know what? I think it was what it happened. I think it, we got an email saying there was a meeting that day, which was odd because I'm like, we got class. And then the meeting was, uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember. He asked me to dig deep into that memory bank. I can't <laughs> no, remember if I just didn't out, go right. to class uh -huh. or if I didn't have class on that day okay. or however the thing was, but whatever it was, we right. all went to the meeting and, you know, you know, he's explaining that, you know, he got fired and, apologizing and, you know, just shaking people's hands and, you know, mm -hmm. just saying, you know, whatever his last goodbyes. But it, it was just kind of like one of the emptiest feelings, you know, for that year. It had already been so much within, a, you know, those first few months of the school year and everything else with everything else going on with the outside world. And it was just it was a lot. And kudos now to players being able to have uh, – options with their mental health and being sure. able to take um I can't remember the running back's name escapes my mind I'm sorry but for Notre Dame he was able to take you know he said he's taking some time off for his mental health and we right. did not have that right. I probably was depressed my freshman year because How could you not? it was just so much coming at you you're sure. homesick you're away from home you're young you're trying to figure everything out but you know it was just one of those things like all right you just need to show up again the next day you know, there was no there was no talk about mental health or any of those things. You know, <laughs> you would have got nah, it wasn't happening. So I, I, it's just one of those things that's, you know, I think it's a little more special now that they can actually talk about those things and work through them. You know? Right. Right. Then a few months later, Notre Dame becomes the laughing stock of college football and they hire an individual who literally was the coach for like five days, I think, or something like that, or six days or something like that. And that was George O'Leary who they say, you know, put something on his resume or whatever. So they let him go. At one point, are you like, okay, I'm definitely out of here because we can't even choose a coach. I don't know. I think you're just numb at that point. You're like, what is going on? You know, because we had a meeting with him before we, we left for break. Okay. So we're thinking, you know, you just kind of, I don't know. I think at that point, I just wanted the Christmas break. I just needed mm. that time off because we weren't mm. going to a bowl game that year. Right. So I don't know. I really, I don't, really don't know at that point. I feel like I was just kind of going through the motions. And again, like I'm here for another year, so I'm I'm sticking it out because this is the academics that I that I needed. And I know I'm thinking about you know that four for forty. You know, I was kind of on that track, but <laughs> you still got to get through that four to get to that 40. So <laughs> to me, it was just like, I have no, it was just a big question mark of what, where we're at, you know, because there was no, 
it was there's no communication from anything. It's just uh, I'm watching it on ESPN like everybody else is. Uh, you know, <laughs> so watching it on the news. It's just like what? So now, out of the blue, you get. Did that happen during a break or how? How much time? I mean, yeah, so it was Christmas break. Kind of okay, so now I feel like I feel like maybe or maybe he got fired as we were leaving or however okay. however it was. Right. But I know it was. It was. It just wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to ask. So then they announced Willingham as the head coach. I mean, what was that like? I mean, was that I'm not even talking about him being a black male, but all of a sudden now you have a coach. How does that feel? Well, it was like, all right, well, we got a coach. And uh, he actually, well, actually, I never t- spoke to him directly, I don't think, before that. But one of the, the coach from Stanford was recruiting me to, okay. uh, to Stanford, but they wanted me to play fullback. I'm like, Nah, I'm good. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's pretty good. I was man. like, well, it's, it was different, but you know, uh, you know, I, I made my decision. I'm like, no, I'm stick with linebacker, and that was really the only school that ever tried to recruit me as a fullback. Okay, it's kind of random, but uh, but other than that, you know, I really had no interaction with him. So yeah. he gets named, and I mean, are you guys calling each other? Are you guys? I mean. Are you guys at school at this point, or you guys? I feel like that was that was still right before we got back. On, I think it was. I'm trying to remember. I feel like that was. uh, I have to check. I have to do my googles. But I feel like that was right before we got back to uh, school and semester started. So, but it was cool though. It was like, okay, this is fresh. This is something new, you know. So you know, I don't. I don't have a baseline to to compare it to. But like, okay, well, again, we'll see where this goes. You know. Seemed like to be a man of character and, and all those good things, checking the box. So, you know, it's like, all right. You are listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest, Corey Mays. So first team meeting with Tyrone Willingham. What was that like? Uh, he just comes off, you know, like, again, a man of character, um, just serious about his business. Um, and, you know, it was just like, OK, cool. You know, like it just felt like, you know, all right, this is going to be the way. Like, this seems like a plan. It seems like somebody who's confident in, in knowing what he's talking about and putting stuff together. But again, I'm I'm still a freshman. I don't know. So I'm just, you know, but I'm just going with the flow because it feels good. You know, it hmm. feels like this is what it's going to be. You know, and I, I know with all the talent we had, you know, this, my freshman year, I said, oh, well, we're going to be good. Well, in, in his first year, you guys were good, but that was when I was in law school at Notre Dame, and I had a meeting with him, and I don't know how many meetings you had in the head coach's office, but I, I had many because I would get kicked out of practice a lot. But <laughs> every time I went to that office, I got I got kind of nervous. And so I had a meeting with him, and I'm walking to the office because it's the, the head coach keeps the same office. And I was walking over there, and I was kind of nervous. I was like, dude, like, I'm a grown-ass man. Like, why am I getting nervous <laughs> to go over this It never escapes you, man. Seriously? It never escapes you. So I, I still there. wake up some, sometimes thinking I'm late for practice. So oh, I, I, think, I think every, every athlete, every athlete has, has that nightmare. So I go over there, and secretary's like, yeah, he's expecting you. His door's open. I walk in, and come in and shake his hand. I'm like, how you doing, sir? He's like, Chris, how you doing? And in the background, and I'll never forget this, Sade is playing. And I was oh, like, man. I was like, wait, this is different. real is this? This is crazy. This is not the number name I'm used to. I walk in this head and do Sade and I'm like, whoa, how, this is amazing. So I'll never, yeah. never, never forget that. Man. <laughs> That's cool. That's well, it's cool. just one of those experiences. So you have a chance. You guys have some success. All of a sudden, now he's out the door. I mean, what is what? What did Kevin White address you guys? The athletic director, or was it something you guys assumed it was going to happen? Um, I'm trying to remember how that happened. I felt like you know it was you know you had the great season, and then it was kind of like an average season, and then another one, and then you just kind of like. It was it was it was bad, man. It wasn't it wasn't good uh, as far as the atmosphere around there and the you know the feelings of things because I mean guys 
it wasn't like we weren't trying. It wasn't like we weren't putting things together. And it's kind of one of those things now it, when, when you're away from the university, just kind of watching the players now and watching, you know, how the seasons go. And, you know, it's like effort and things like that. And, you know, you just think about coaching. Is, are the right people in place? You know, all the – are the right schemes in place? Do we have the right, you know, things going? And I don't, obviously, uh, I guess we did not, <laughs> you know, so because it did not translate. But I, I think it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we, again, we were in the locker room and it was just kind of like finding out all together, seeing the coaches walk out with their stuff. And it was just like, again, you know, that is just, <laughs> like, like you know, I said, just, I mean, the football I mean, it's, you know, you realize, you know, the only people that were staying there are the players, you know, so it's like, all right, well, we'll have to regroup again, you know, and this, you know, and I'm thinking like, you know, you kind of feel like sand, right? Sand in your hands, flowing through your hands, like the dreams of the NFL are kind of fading away. And, you know, myself individually, you know, because it's like, all right, you know, I'm playing special teams and I'm, I'm doing great at that, but it's not really, uh, translating into my position and getting on the field. And sure. I think that I don't know your next question, so I don't want to overstep that. But well, I well, think no, no, uh, but, but the the next one's going to be and again, because I think this is fascinating and it's a great learning experience for you at such a young age. Right. You, you talked about yep. kind of the uh, a culture change. You, you, you talked about being kind of a, 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 a um, uh, oblivious to kind of change now, right? I mean, you can throw anything at you now, but, and this is great. Again, at the time it sucked, right? I mean, you got, you got, oh yeah, yeah, it out. sucked. <laughs> it well, sucked. Here's the thing. I just I'm hope thinking that we're going to, you know, New Year's bowls every year, you know, like we're going to, you know, we're going to have nice rings, everything, you know, like, you know, it's going to be the glitz and glam and everything of college football, you know, and it, and it just wasn't. So, it, it was, it, but it wasn't as far as the winning. Let me say well, that. Well, we're not, and, and we'll talk about that as well. But I also want to get into kind of your idea of kind of how you're feeling now. You know, you have a chance to kind of get that fifth year when Tyrone leaves. I and mean, are you sitting there going, "Man, is the next coaching staff are they going to grant me this fifth year? Or how's that going to work?" Uh, you know what? It, 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 you know, there was a little piece of me saying, you know, I just kind of thought, you know, I'm going to get it. Mm -hmm. You know. It wasn't it wasn't anything arrogant or ego about it. Right. It was just kind of like, you know, it, it's going to happen. And then I saw that a few people weren't granted the fifth year. I was like, <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh, no. You know, but, mm. um, you know, it, it, I, I just I had faith, you know, and I felt like it was my last hoorah. It was my last chance. It was, you know, everything was was on the line. You know, and I had to figure out a way to kind of switch my mind and lock in a little bit more wow. and do something different, you know, because wow. I felt like, you know, my position coach before, like, it just wasn't, for whatever reason, it just wasn't clicking. It just okay. wasn't, it wasn't there for me, you know. I don't think he necessarily believed in me, uh -huh. you know, just kind of is what it is, right. you know, and I, but I, I, I accept that and I, and I love that that happened the way it happened because it it works out on the back end. It just happens to work out on the back end, you know, well, but, it, it, but you know, in life it might not have, right, but right. there's a lesson for me that was learned uh, on the back end of that, my rookie year. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and here's the thing, and this is what is kind of the sad part, right? Is that it was kind of used as maybe motivation as learning experience for you but, you know, you had a hundred other guys in the squad that may have had different feelings about, you know, and I'm sure there are stories about guys in your class that may have lost contact or they may have gone off the deep end because their experience was so bad. Yeah, uh, there is. I mean, you, you see it in, in guys' eyes. You know, you mm. see that light mm. leave uh, guys' eyes. And the more, mm. I, the more I'm older now, the more I think about it and the more conversations I have about things, because I think sometimes many of us were never on the same page or we huh. thought, you know, this is this way, this is that way. And I'm not talking about football. I'm just talking about the experience because sure, you know, we sure. were all kind of just going through our own things that we had going on. Um, you know, and we're all young men growing, in, growing into ourselves and becoming men, 
you know, and dealing with it, whatever we have going on, you know, I, you know, sometimes you don't think about what people are dealing with back home. Right. You know, right. I lost exactly. friends to, to gun violence in Chicago, Chicago. And then sometimes it was like football was the last thing about mine. Mm. You know, <laughs> you know, when you, 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 you go into practice or you go into to morning workouts in the winter, you're like, this is the last, I don't even feel like being here right now. Mm-hmm. It's not taking anything for granted. Right. You know, obviously everything is a blessing in being there, but it's just life circumstances. And I think sometimes uh, those doors weren't open to have those discussions and, you know, and to be open about a lot of things. So I think there's there's a lot of light that left a lot of people. And it's unfortunate, you know, that a lot of people have uh, that left South Bend with a bitter taste in their mouth. But, you know, I, I know that happens across campuses all across America every year where it didn't work out. Right. You know, you were all American, you were everything. And, you know, you get to that to that place and, you know, it becomes a numbers game or a politics game or whatever game you want to call it. But I, I thought and I always told myself, don't let that be an excuse for yourself that is politics or is this or is that like whether it might be blatant or not or it's something in your face and it's obvious. Tell yourself it's something different and, you know, that that becomes that show up again the next day thing because you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, and obviously three, three head coaches later, <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, I become a starter on the field, you know, it's at linebacker, but technically I was always a starter because you got to start the game with kickoff and, and like kickoff it. return I anyway. Like so, like you it. know, um, <laughs> when we come back from this break, um, I want to talk to Corey about, kind of all the adversity he talked about was going on at home, all this other stuff. And he graduates in three and a half years, which I think is absolutely amazing. But when we get back, we'll, we'll have a conversation about that. We run the clock, Super 16, it's the cream of the crop. College football time of year, don't stop. We're, We're adding this guy. Just another go down with the courage. Ain't no bias with Zorris breaking truth traded in the golden helmet in the past for a suit with the tape never lie college ball he's a stoop breaking the top 16 not the top 32 I don't mean to cut you off like a Zorris jersey but you ain't really grinding let the jersey dirty hit the running back like a Mack truck behind the 30 yard line it's game time my team ride you look at Chris like this with a fact check list Going over college teams like a busy scientist Steve streaking from his head like in his playing days Super 16 polls on the show straight away It's the FBS, the best of the best From the ACC to the SEC Pac-12, Big 10, Mount West, Sun Belt And the Big 12, open your eyelids Who the best we like the Super 16 is the cream of the crop College football time of year, don't stop With Christopher Zurich, just another go down with the curve Heart, skill, and will Bringing you the best 16 Serving up a plate for the football teams Breaking the best 16 college teams Football fans, it's the show of your dreams You can check out the Super 16 Poll Show with me on Monday nights on this channel, 7.30 Central, 8.30 Eastern Time. Uh, or you can actually listen to them on wherever you get your favorite podcasts. I'll be discussing and breaking down the top 16 teams in the country from the Super 16 poll, which is a poll produced by the Football Writers of Association, excuse me, Football Writers of America Association and the National Football Foundation. And I'll also give you a chance to take a look at my top five matchups for that week. So, Corey, I wanted to talk about kind of all the chaos that's going on, yet somehow, some way, you are taking enough classes, you're going to summer school, you're doing everything you can, and you graduate in three years. How is that even possible? Well, really, uh, we, you know, we had, uh, you know, summer workouts. I think my freshman year, I I think it was, you know, like six weeks off after the last, uh, you know, the spring semester after, you know, you're done with your finals. Mm -hmm. I believe it was six weeks off. And then you, you know, you came back for summer school. 
you know, and work out with the team and everything. And I think my freshman year, I stayed the full six weeks. And that second year, uh, I always I, I came back early. Okay. Uh, number one, I can get classes done. Number two, you got a food check. So, know. you know, that was one hundred eighty dollars <laughs> a week. That might as well have been eighteen thousand dollars a week. <laughs> You know, because you didn't have to pay for housing. So, I know you know, I, I feel like, you know, you know, that was that was money, you know, and I was I wasn't in Chicago. I wasn't, you know, around any unnecessary situations that I didn't have to be in. And, you know, I was making sure that I was doing something productive and, you know, first of all, getting in shape, getting back early, getting in shape and, you know, taking classes and making sure I, I had to do everything I had to do. So for me, it was just, you know, it was a jump start. And it was mm -hmm. a good way to put a little money in your pocket, a little so gas money in your pocket. Did, <laughs> did someone on the staff, an, an academic advisor, did they put you aside and say, you know, hey, look, looking at your grades, you know, this is something that you could do? Or was it just kind of something that you kind of put two and two together on your own? It was probably a combination of the both of okay. uh, trying to figure out, you know, the best way to start knocking things out. And you had two I majors, like, by the way. I forgot about that. You had two majors, too. Sorry. Yeah. Psychology and sociology. Uh, nothing too crazy. But, you know, I feel like I just if I could do it again, I wouldn't have loaded up. I felt like I was loading up too much during the season. Okay. Um, <laughs> too many credits to the way the class flow was. I feel like I like Monday, Wednesday, Friday I had like three classes in a row. So you like go work out. I feel like my freshman year was like the the morning workout, three classes in a row, 15 minutes between that last class and uh, the first practice. meetings for oh, practice. Okay. Yeah. And then after that, you had to hurry up and get to a uh, study hall, you know, uh -huh. all the way. You had to run it. You had to get to South Downey Hall and then get to study hall you know, and be there for an hour or two. So oh. I, I, for the life of me, I don't know how you didn't hustle to tr try to try to not be in that, you know, for your second semester. So sure. I did everything in my power to get out of that, you know, first semester. You know, I said, I can go study anywhere else. I don't need to go study in a designated place. Right. <laughs> you right. Know? right. Well, I mean, and I think you're being modest as well, because, I mean, nerding is a challenge for anyone. Okay, I don't care what school you went to, I don't care what your SAT scores were. It's a great academic institution, but you pile on a full-time job, which we all know football is. And yeah. <laughs> literally, that job isn't going well during the time you were there, right? I mean, you had all the coaching teams, so there's adversity there. It's just chaos. You got 9-11, and you got all this stuff going on, yet somehow you were still able to get those credits, you're able to, I'm assuming, graduate in three and a half years and then have Notre Dame pay for your graduate work, which yeah. I don't think a lot of kids take advantage of. Well, I think I think they're doing it now. And I think mm -hmm. things have changed so much that they're able to uh, take advantage of those things. But, right. you know, like they're having, uh, they're having study abroad programs. Guys are getting to go travel to different countries and do that. Right there, I mean, can you imagine asking coaches like, "Can I go abroad?" <laughs> like, you don't get out of my office. Well, here's the interesting <laughs> story. I know um, Chris Stewart was a teammate of yours, correct? Uh, I think he was right. Was Chris there at the same? I'm trying to remember if we were there at the same time or okay. if he was right after me. Because I, he actually did a uh, an abroad program. Yeah. And, yeah. and his crazy um, ass, he actually went to law school while he was playing. So. It, it, that that was insane. That I, I I didn't understand how people were able to uh, to do all those things like that. You know, it, it takes a special mind. Some of y'all, some of you guys are just geniuses. That's just yeah. it. Just is what it is. You so know, just, the combination <laughs> of your career, I'm assuming, may have been one night. I think it was the month of October. You guys played a number one USC team, and their name was ranked yes. number nine, and can you tell us a little bit about kind of what was what was the not, not necessarily the week preparation, but what was the atmosphere around that game? Because just to let you get let's the, the folks listening know, I was very fortunate enough to speak at the pep rally, which blew my mind because as much success as we had, we won a national championship. I won't brag about that, but <laughs> they had the pep rally in the stadium. In the stadium. That had yep. never happened before. And it was live on ESPN. That had never happened before, bro. Yes. So 
it was insane. So talk, talk to us a little bit about kind of, again, not necessarily the whole week, but what, what was the atmosphere of moving after think- that game? We, we were so hyped during the week to play that game, right? Because, you know, like, my last time we beat USC was my freshman year. Okay. And, you know, like, and each game after that, we were just getting whooped. I mean, embarrassed, tossed around, whatever whatever words you want to throw in there. Um, just 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 not good. We did not look good. So I think it's, it's my last time playing USC. I want to go out with a bang, and I want to go out with a win. And I remember, I think it was – Thursday or Friday, you know, Coach Weiss came to me and said, you're speaking, um, you and Mosto or Ristoval are speaking uh, at the pep rally. I'm like, ooh-wee. Then I found out it was in the stadium. Ooh-wee. You know, and then it was walking into that stadium and seeing all those people in there. And I'm like, for the pep rally. You know, it's just, it was crazy. I mean, it was just, it felt electric. You know, it just, you wanted to play play the game right there right then and there, you know, so it was, it was just something completely different. And then, you know, that Saturday morning, walking from the Basilica, you know, over to the stadium, it was just packed. It was just packed the whole way. And you just felt the energy the whole way there. And it just felt like this is college football. This is what this is supposed to be like, you know, and it's just something that, you know, cause you're just so passionate about it. It'll bring tears to your eyes. You know, I just think about it now and I just think about because that's how much I love this game. That's how much I loved being a part of it and feeling grateful that I was and blessed that I was able to play. And Dude, I, mean, I got that chills, game, man. You're talking to me now. I'm getting chills, man. I'm getting fired <laughs> up, man. I mean, that game just lived up to the hype. And I mean, just just going out there and being able for that last time, you know, because I thought about every other player that was there with me, you know, and we played those games. They're watching this game today. They're going to see if we're going to do this today. And, you know, you want to win for them. You obviously want to win for everybody there that's in the stadium, but you want to win for them because they can't, they can't, they ran out of time. They ran out of clock. They ran out of eligibility, you know, so they can't do anything else now. So Mm. that's who you're doing it for. And I think, Mm. man, it was just, it was something I've never heard the stadium that loud, you know, there was just a different type of energy. Cause you know, sometimes, you know, in the yellow seats there, Sure. Very of good play. Yes. <laughs> you know, but it was color. it was it was it was different. It was different. Ah. People were hyped. So That's, that is absolutely amazing. I mean it was just I you know, it's just something you never forget. Something you just never forget. And uh, I mean, sadly enough, you guys didn't come away with a victory, but um that game was kind of gone into the historical historical annals with the bush push. But yeah. I know a couple of plays before that, you, you made a huge play, right? Did you force a fumble? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'll tell you this, though. So he rolls out. He's running. I just run. I'm like, he can't score. I just kind of put my head down and just, <laughs> hey, whatever happens, happens. And, you know, the ball comes out. We get up. You know, there's, there's you know, kind of chaos. And I look up at the, the scoreboard, and the time is running down, and the time runs out. So for about 45, 30 to 45 seconds, I know what it felt like to win that game because we were celebrating. So at least I know what it felt like to win that game. Oh. And then I hear over the PA system, it, you know, the Notre Dame crowd does not leave the field and we penalize. I'm like, penalize for what? The game's over. <laughs> no, nah, let's line back up for another play. And then, oh. you know, obviously, you know, they were able to get in. But, you know, people say the bush push and all that, you know, I mean, to me, what's fair is fair, right? We should have never been in that position. I mean, we had them in fourth and six. Sure. Um, you know, the coordinator talked about it at the game. He said I should have played like two man. I think we played like cover one man or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just it just kind of is what it is. So you can't complain about this was cheated or this was this or this was that because you know you never should have been in that position. Right. You know, and it and it right. sucks that we're not able to uh, have that. You know, is one of our bragging things to talk about, you know, because I, I would definitely go on a world tour about that. You know, I wish it would have ended on that. I wish it would have ended on that, uh, you know, causing the fumble and of everything. My, I might have a statue outside the stadium causing a fumble or something. Exactly. Like no. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, though, um, it's just one of those things about that's great about college football. You just never know. Um, it always comes down to the very last play, and you got to step up. But I think 
uh, the thing I loved most about that team that year was we lost that game. We were down that night. People were working, you know, the very next day in the very next, that first day of practice, you know, mm-hmm. we're clapping it up. We're, you know, we're, we're hyped because we're like, we still, th- this isn't done. The season didn't end because of that loss. You know, right. we still, we still got work to do. So I, I think that's one of those things where, you know, you have a good team and, you know, everybody is, you know, it wasn't, you know, moping around and feeling sorry for ourselves. It's like, no, we still got opportunities. We're still here. Sure. <laughs> the season still sure. goes on, you know? Well, so. and kind of on those lines, I mean, and you may, may not remember, I, mean, I don't remember a lot of my games, but what was the feeling like in the locker room after you guys went in there? I mean, were guys crying? Were guys, you know, just was it silent? I mean, what was it like? I don't, I don't really remember. I think, mm-hmm. I, I think we were all, there was disappointment, right? Mm-hmm. There was disappointment, but I think it, it was still like kind of that. I love you atmosphere. Like, man, you fought, you fought today. You know, I love the way you fought today. You know, we came up short, but I love the way you fought today. Right. And it wasn't a blame game and it wasn't pointing fingers. And I think that's the sign of a great team, you know, that, mm-hmm. you know, that you go in there, you just love each other. You know, it's just, it's something to where, you know, you're not looking to tear it down. You're looking to build up. But yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty doggone disappointing. Mm. Pretty doggone disappointing that day. Well, we, we've kind of talked about your experience at Notre Dame, and, and a lot of people don't have a chance to go on to the next level, but you did, and you spent five years there. Um, one of your coaches during that time was, the guy who's in uh, New England, who I absolutely love and people cannot stand. So <laughs> as a fan, I want to ask you, what was it like to have Coach Belichick as your coach? That was great. It was great, actually. Uh, you know, I think just when any coach, any coach can rub people the wrong way or, you know, there's a business aspect to things, and this, that and the other. But I, I felt in my personal experience that it was great because Every game we went into, I felt like we were going to win. Mm. I felt like when he came in the room and we watched film and we broke things down. So I was there uh, that year when they were talking about cheating and everything and, and the filming wow. and all that stuff. But, you know, whatever the case might be, they said it was inconclusive, whatever the case might be, there was never a time where we were in there and somebody was playing signals, you know, right. in a team meeting or any right. of that stuff. I mean, they would literally come in and just break down a film with stuff that's on the film. Like, well, if his right foot is back, it's going to be this. If his left foot mm-hmm. is back, it's this. If his hand is like this, you can think about this and this. I mean, it was it was incredible. It was incredible to be around that veteran presence. And I think that was the greatest way I could have came into the league because, uh, you know, I went to my second year after the fourth week. I went to the Monday. I was a Patriot. Wednesday, you know, I was a Bengal. So it was, and that was a completely different atmosphere, mm. but you wouldn't know because you think, you know, it's, it's the NFL, but it's right. really 32 different companies, right. you know, and it's 32 right. different cultures, <laughs> but Belichick was awesome. And I, I think mm. it was, I applaud and I'm so blessed that I went into that situation of learning how to be a professional, how to approach the game on and off the field, you know, being the first one there and the last one to leave and just having that work ethic. And, you know, the biggest thing, he said, you know, to rookies, you know, you don't know, so don't say. And also, if you don't play special teams, you won't make this team because wow. you know, if, you, if you're not a starter. And I'm thinking in my head, well, that's all I've been doing the past 50 <laughs> years is playing special teams. I got so I'm good, good to go. I'm good to go. <laughs> and it was funny to see players, you know, mostly play their position kind of struggle on special teams to make that adjustment because it is it is way different. I remember just sprinting back, you know, one of the first practices and the vets come in and I turn around and the dude zooms right past me. So it was like, okay, this is a whole nother different <laughs> so you, That's a whole Like you start, one. you start breaking out geometry, you start mm-hmm. breaking out math. Okay. Mm-hmm. What is the fastest way you can get there? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you know, where the hash marks, I mean, you really, the special teams coach, he really broke things down for us. And it was really eye opening to how much you really need to know, you know, how many yards are between the numbers and the hash between the numbers and, you know, the sideline or, you know, your angles and getting there and, and setting yourself up. You know, what, what, what are great ways you can do, you know, and we did a lot of work after practice. Um, I mean, a lot of work after practice 
So it, you know, that really, some of us really hated it too, but it was a lot of work. I mean, doing tackling drills and all this other right. stuff, but you know, it sucked at that time, but I didn't realize, you know, that was really setting me up to really, you know, gain some, some, a little longevity in the league past the average uh, years that you play, you know? So sure. and, and a lot of folks don't understand. I mean, you know, a lot of folks they watch games on Sunday and they're like, Oh, Hey, this is great. No one understands. I mean, you're talking about literally 53 team or 53 members on the team plus a practice squad group. Yeah. 32 teams. These are the best athletes to ever, that are in the world. I mean, it's not, and again, I'm a little biased, but there's a reason why football games are only once a week, right? Hockey's a couple times a week. Every other game a couple times a week. Football, your, your body gets <laughs> broke down and it has to get yes. back up in a yeah. week. Yeah. All while you're still practicing and hitting during the week. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's trying to charge your body up and, and do things the right way. And, you know, I learned from, you know, Mike Vrabel and Teddy Bruschi and Rodney mm. Harrison. I mean, all these guys, it's like the all-stars all around me, right by my locker, just Roosevelt Colvin, you know, like all these guys were there uh, who I can, you know, I learned from, you know, sure. and, uh, you know, were able to teach me. And, I, you know, I'm always thankful for that because I carry many of those lessons to this day. I remember um, the day I know I'm, I'm going to Cincinnati and uh, Rodney told me, man, that's life in a big city. You've learned everything you need to know here. So go ahead and mm. go and take the same thing. And it was just like, OK, everything's going to be cool, you know, because, you, you know, people don't realize you go to a new team. That's all new teammates, all new coaches, all new medical staff, all new upper level management, all new weight training staff, all new uh, equipment all new, staff. Everything. I mean, there's every everything is new. You know, you might know a few players on the team, but, you know. I just take the that same same you know work ethic there that I had you know in New England you know and that's, that's the only way you can survive because you're you're the new person on the team so you know everybody's trying to figure you out and see who you are you know but you know the original question of Belichick you know I I stamp him as you know we're talking about a coach and, and people don't really realize you know because he gives the, what he gives the media but he's really funny really sarcastic and a really funny guy. Wow. You know behind the scenes i mean it, so it's i you know i i enjoyed my experience there and i you know i, I love that i i had that you know because it was very unique well and, and kind of on those lines when talking about your experience going to other teams i mean again this is kind of preparing you right for when you get finished and, and i think one of the yeah. things that I, I talked about in the beginning that of the show that you've taken advantage of. Can you share a little bit about what kind of opportunities you took advantage of during the off seasons? Um, I know there's an executive yeah. program that the, the NFL has. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so they, I think it's now just university of Michigan that they have. Well, yeah. But Wharton, first, Harvard and yeah, it was Harvard, uh, Wharton. And those were two, um, you went twice during the all season to them. So you had like a, a first session for a week and then a second session for a week. So mm. Harvard, Wharton, Northwestern, Notre Dame. I didn't make it to the Stanford one. Okay. Um, and then uh, there's a few others uh, that I went to. So I felt like I didn't, I wasn't able to do it my, my first year, okay. uh, my rookie year, that off season. But I'm glad again, that there were so many veterans on that team that were kind of hit putting you to, game about things that were going on. So it was like, all right, let me take advantage of this in the off season. Because one, I was an undrafted free agent. So I always felt like one foot in, one foot out the door. Sure. So let me start thinking about the next step regardless. So, you know, and it was always eye-opening to see your peers, how truly talented people were uh, around the league. Because you forget people did go to college, uh, <laughs> you know, but there were people really doing some special things, some great uh -huh. things while they were still playing. And that really sparked me to really think, you know, beyond that box of being a player. And then then what after that, you know, the transition from professional sports from the league is still extremely difficult. It's still extremely hard to let go and, and move on, and you know, and put yourself in another position, but taking advantage of that off season, all those off season things. Um, like, have you done the broadcast boot camp? 
I have not, but I, I saw. You need with, to do the you. broadcast boot camp. Okay. You, I mean, with your platform that you already have, uh, you would really shine because I mean, you you get to do. They walk you through everything. Uh, you're in the studio. You know, you're doing the mock-ups. You get the video. You get real-time feedback uh, mm. from actual producers, ESPN producers, BC Sport, all those things. So if it's, I mean, you already. I mean, you're already way ahead. So they had the regular boot camp and they had the advanced broadcast boot camp. Okay. Because I think it's definitely something you could be calling games or, you know, have your show or, you know, uh, you know. Well, whatever. I, I will absolutely you know, talk to you about that. That'll be, that'll be great, man. And, yeah. I, I think trying, it's, to, trying to produce my own little thing over here with, with my mouth. Well, I, 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 well, I think that's the great thing about it, right? Is now you, you're able to get sponsorship and partnerships and, and bring those things out. Like mm -hmm. it was great for me in t the 2019 season to do uh inside Irish sports, you know, after the game, the post game uh, mm -hmm. show uh, for Notre Dame, you know, and okay. it felt like, you know, that felt really special. And unfortunately we weren't able to do it in 2020. You know, right. I was kind of really looking forward to that, uh, you know, coming back and trying to be a part of that, but uh, if they would have, <laughs> okay. but you know, it's just, it's something you get that bug about it. And you're just like, man, I really want to do it. I really want to be a part of it, but I really think you should be, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt your show to tell you about. No, 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 that's, hey, I, I, but I, I think that's something that's really that. up your alley, okay. you know, as, as far as you expanding and having all those contacts, because then people know because there's so much noise. There's so many podcasts. There's so many shows sure. now that really narrows it down. It's like, right. all right, well, you're in the Chicago area. Why don't we have you do this with this, with this, with this, you know, you know, I think I will, that, we can definitely yeah. talk about it. That'd be good. Yeah. But Absolutely. this is about you, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a little about you because you finished playing in 2010, and you not only start a company to become an angel investor, but when did you think about going back to get your MBA? Well, really, I had thought about it for a few years, you know, and doing those executive education programs, you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it. And but I I actually dove into business into the business world and quickly realized that this is not like sports. First of all, uh, football we say you got the A gap, you got the A gap. <laughs> business is all this gray area. It starts is business is the equivalent to to all the players out there. You'll understand this. And when a coach you're in a meeting, you say, "What do I do here?" And they say, "Just be a football player." Mm. You know, that's what business is like. It's it's all this gray area. People are saying, you know, to you that, you know, it's going to take two weeks. I mean, down to the minute, I'd be knocking on the door or phone call or email, whatever the case may be, you know, that, because you said this is right. what it's going to be. Right. Exactly. And I quickly began to find out that's not the case, that, you know, being um, consistent and people uh, showing up for things is, is not the case. And I couldn't understand why. You know, <laughs> you know, if you say you're going to do something, you got to do it. Right. And I think that was the hardest part for me and having that patience and also not, you know, people can get disrespectful and very uh, arrogant. And, you know, you can't blitz somebody on fourth and one in a meeting room and <laughs> jump across the table because right, right. they got these things called laws and they arrest you and all that. But, man, it was it was very difficult uh, to make that adjustment because when I walked into the room, People assumed a lot of things, right? You're an athlete or you're this, you don't know anything. It's like, well, I did go to college. I did graduate. Why do I all of a sudden get, you know, some stigma put on me? You know, and it's, you know, and it's unfortunate. And it took a, it was extremely humbling, you know, to start over and try to claw your way back in and, and try to figure out things from the bottom. But it was, it was, it, it was very, it's a very difficult transition. Uh, trying to fi figure things out. And then people see you as a dollar sign, you know, but sure. the good thing is, you know, while you're playing, people are always approaching you about ideas. And I reinvented oxygen, you know, I reinvented water, and, you know, and, you know, it's, it, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Well, and this is the part that I think is so unique is <clears throat> there's only a handful of us who have played at Notre Dame and are double donors. And mm. not only mm. is that kind of a, a small <laughs> kind of a fraternity, but when you look at what you've accomplished since then, I think is amazing. And 
not only is it special and should you be on a poster, you know, around their name talking about, you know, everything that you've accomplished and, and what athletes can do. I mean, talk to us a little bit about kind of what it was like going through the program, because as you mentioned before, I mean, you had all these challenges, but at the end of the day, I mean, you actually accomplished it, you finished it. And that's important to know. The crazy thing is, Chris, when you say, uh, you talk about accomplishments and I, I have this thing where I, I'm sure you do too, as athletes, as they were competitors, is I look around and I say, damn, he invented the internet. Why didn't I think of that? I'm not working hard enough. So it's like, I don't, I don't give myself nearly any credit. I think I tweeted this out the other day. I'm like, I, I, you need to give yourself more credit. Cause I feel like- That's like be a hype man. That's, that's like I could be, I could be a hype man. That's why I had a great intro for you, man. <laughs> I'm to be a hype man. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, I, I, I'm always looking around. I'm always seeing other. It's just like you you play that compare and contrast game, and especially with the Notre Dame alumni. They're just doing so many amazing things. You're like, Jesus Christ, give me a break. Can I get something? But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, it got to a point. I'm like, well, I'm in business. I'm in business. I'm doing this. But what about the next step? And so, you know, it, it kind of hits you. Well, what are the next five years? five years pass and it's like, well, what are the next five years of my life, 10 years look like, you know, if I want to stop being an entrepreneur and I want to go corporate, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. You know, am I pigeonholed at this point? You know, what do I do next? And, you know, I started looking at programs and I saw the, uh, I saw the poster. I think I was going, I was walking through the airport. I was walking through Midway and I saw the, uh, you know, the executive MBA for Notre Dame in Chicago poster. I said, Hmm. And so, uh, you know, thought about it, but then think about it. And then, you know, I saw it again and then just kind of, all right, let me Google. And I think I saw an email, so let me Google, let me look it up. And really, uh, it was crazy. I saw the deadline coming up and I thought, okay, what do I do? So I had to get letters of recommendation, write the essay, wow. get all this other stuff together. I think it was like over the weekend, mm. but it was, you know, you figure out, how resilient are you <laughs> when you need to get something done? Um, not that it was anything impossible, but, you know, it's just the fact that a matter that, like, all right, uh, boom, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. So being able to do that and was able to get into the program, mm -hmm. it was amazing because it was right downtown, you know, Chicago, about 10 minute train ride from me, you know, or if I drove in, it was cool because we had to be there earlier in the morning anyway, but it was a grind. I will say that it was definitely a grind, but it was it was something different because now your classmates were like new teammates now. Mm. And like, you know, it wasn't sports weren't, you know, bogging you down or anything like, you know, every, everybody has their job and their family, whatever the sure. case they have. But at least when you came there for that weekend, you know, everybody was locked in. You know, and there were some times where I was like, I don't know how all this is going to get done, but you figure out a way. You know, it's 168 hours in a week and you start to figure out what you can cut, what's important, what's not important to you and learning mm -hmm. how to, you know, how to sacrifice again. And I realized, man, there's there's a lot of time wasted doing things you think you're productive in. And it's really not productive. You know, so you stop taking so many meetings. Sometimes, you know, you know, just like college, you have me. We're going to have a meeting about the meeting. Oh, about exactly. The meeting. Oh, exactly. Come on, exactly. coach. <laughs> I just so. for that. And one of the things I didn't understand was, and, and I, I realized that, but I thought after the first seven to 10 times that we did the same play, it's okay, can we move on to another one? But, <laughs> you know, the idea that you're, you're literally teaching football to a very diverse crowd, like maybe 10 plays of the same play was good for me, but maybe the other person next to me, he needed 20 which is yeah. what we did. And it was like, why are we wasting our time? We got 20. I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. So <laughs> I totally understand it. So what, what I want to talk a little bit about was, so you started um, uh, Amazing Enterprises before you went to law school, right? So you became an angel investor before you went to uh, the executive MBA program, right? Yeah. Now, I didn't go to law school. That'd be good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That, that, was, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. But... <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> wow. So, but 
what did what did you learn from your experience through the MBA program that you are using now with being an, an, an angel investor? Uh, really, I think it's, it all comes down to people and it all comes down to psychology um, because you can always pick up a book. You can always you know, go on YouTube. You can get information, you know, learn about, you know, different business aspect, accounting, finance, spreadsheets, whatever the case may be. I think it's really about learning yourself and learning what your purpose is, okay. and, you know, and further kind of pulling out your EQ and figuring out how, <coughs> excuse me, how do you work um, with other people? How do you continue to expand yourself and come out of your shell because I'm really an introvert, right? I can, I turn it on when I have to be, be all the energy and everything. But for the most part, if I don't have to be, I'll just go into a shell and just go into a cave and just work. And I think that was the most important thing for me is to be more outgoing and to, you know, I had to because of business is be outgoing, you know, and sports, but it's just like, all right, be more out of, out of your comfort zone. And I think that's what it's about. It's just being out of your comfort zone and and uh, expanding, you know, and, and not being put in a box. And I think that's that's what's most important for a lot of people, especially as they get older. We get set into our ways and, right. you know, we think, all right, it's only going to be this way. No, you have to continue to expand. You have to continue to learn. You have to continue to grow. And I think that was one of the most impactful uh, experiences about it. Um, yeah. It was just that was that was the biggest thing to me and learning how to balance and juggle. And, and I learned a lot from different people uh, about family, about how to work a life balance. I mean, there's so much stuff outside of that classroom uh, aspect that you learn about and you begin to see people grow. Right. You watch people have kids doing a program and watch people go through relationships and watch people change jobs and watch people go through tra- <clears throat> traumatic incidents and tragedies in your life. And I mean, that the, really that first week, uh, they call it NIL, uh, is really a personal journey, um, you know, through the program. And we, we did that that first week on campus. And I mean, it was it was absolutely amazing. You know, I mean, you had people going back to their childhood, bringing stuff out and, mm. you know, but I think the great thing about it was it put everybody's feet on the ground, right? Because you it's pretty intimidating, right? Like, you know, I get I get that imposter syndrome all the time of man, should, do I belong in this room? Do I belong in this room? Which is crazy because you belong in it, but you know, you always think everybody else has more experience than you. Sure. And then you find out when you get on that level ground, you're like, okay, well, they have insecurities or they have things that they don't know about and they're worried about, or they only specialize in this, but I know about this and we can help each other here and we can do everything here. So I think that was the most important thing is, you know, it's like, man we're all human beings and we're all, nobody's perfect. And, you know, you got to make sure you get past all those titles that people have and, and whatever else that they carry around with them. And like, we're all on the same level ground now. So let's get to work, you know? So what was, did you have a mentor that kind of got you into um, being an angel investor or was it something that you knew you were going to do when you got finished with playing in the league? I mean, how does that start? And did you kind of seek people out to help? Uh, I did. Uh, there was uh, kind of several people I was around. Um, really, it's probably something I shouldn't have been doing, uh, to be to be really? honest. Okay. Because, I mean, when you think about it, you're at that level of you've kind of hit a jackpot a little bit, no matter how much you're making. You you kind of set yourself up. You you got a good nest egg, right? And you know, the thing about if you go to grad school, you're going to take all these classes. They're going to talk about risk and you wouldn't take risk. And, <laughs> you know, so it, it would be something, you know, kind of if I had done that before, I might not I might not have even gone down that path because okay. there's so much risk involved, you know, and you're betting on people. Right. Because ideas are good. You know, they're great. But that that person has to be the one that has to execute. Sure. So, you know, but, you know, I was able to have some success while I was playing, investing in a few companies. Uh, a friend of mine, their their company was able to survive, you know, 2008, the crash, um, because, you know, I did a loan for them. They were able to survive the competition around them uh, and weather that storm, which I was like, OK, so that's success. So that's kind of one of those things that kind of pushed me into it. And then doing those executive 
education programs, seeing, you know, other players uh, start their ventures and do great things. So it was like, okay, well, this is something that can be done. So, uh, and then, you know, and not knowing exactly what I wanted to do once I was done playing, you know, okay. you know, doing a Hollywood boot camp, doing a broadcast boot camp. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> the journalism boot camp. I mean, there was any all the resources that the NFL was providing. I was trying to take advantage of, right. you know, with people saying, you know, <clears throat> you'll be good at that. You know, you should do that. You know, so just trying to take advantage of everything around me. And that's just one thing that I fell into. You know, I was I figured, hey, I want to I want to have my name on a building like everybody else in Notre Dame does, you know, so <laughs> but I realized some people are very lucky, too. Uh, so it's not. <laughs> It's not necessarily skill. It's being in the right place at the right time and, you know, things going well. So, you know, I've definitely seen my fair share of ups and downs in business and, you know, some hard times and some good times, too. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I just, (laughs) you know, to do it again, I'm being attacked. I need some water. I don't know how you're doing this. (laughs) Well, kind of along those lines, I mean, are there any companies you'd like to share with us that, that you're involved in? Yeah, uh, Love Corkscrew. There we go. Sean Lampley right. out of Chicago. Uh, okay. She's done an amazing job. That's Love of, Corkscrew? Uh, yes, Love Corkscrew Wine. Um, the lifestyle brand as well. So she has candles and other other lifestyle things as well. But it's been amazing to watch her journey uh, and, you know, the way she's built the brand and, and you know, got it into stores and national uh and making it a national brand and, and expanding, wow. and you know, it's just, and you know, it feels good to be to know I was a part of that, you know, sure. and to and to watch all the the hard work that goes into it, you know, it's just it's it's simply amazing. So that's one of the things I will plug. Um, Lovecorpsecrew.com. Drink you responsible. You know, I'll but, um, no, yeah. actually, what I'll do, uh, I'll put a listing um, in the description area of, of the website. So. Folks okay. Go there and awesome, get awesome, awesome, awesome. Absolutely. But yeah, it's yeah. been it's been amazing kind of diversifying and investing in different companies. So learning about like smart tech for smart cities sure. all the way to wine and spirits, you know. So it's it's been, you know, you learn a little bit about everything, you know, but it can burn you out because you're learning a little bit about everything sure. instead of specializing in one area. But you know, for me it's been, you know, I, I think that's that's been the amazing journey for me. And I know that, you know, I'm thinking about the next steps now. All right. What else do you want to get into now um, beyond investing? You know, what what is the next five to 10 years of my life look like now? You know, because okay. you always have to be continuously thinking about the next step. You know, right. 2020, you know, is, <laughs> you know, that shows you that, you know, like all of this can stop or, you know, you know, whatever the case may be. So, you know, what's next? OK, well, can you share with us kind of your involvement with the Obama Energy Corporation, I mean, being the the VP of marketing. I mean, can you talk to us about that? So that was one of the um, first companies I got involved with uh, okay. investing in. It started off with LED lighting and then moved into smart cities and tele streets, uh, smart poles. Wow. So it's been um, it's been a, a, a labor of love <laughs> because it's is is it was really eye opening to get into the politics and re- like real politics and and see how cities work and see how things get put together and and universities as well and watching you know a cell cycle come together and watching how uh people are put in place that should not be in place and i think mm. uh, this isn't a political conversation but you know there's it's actually kind of scary a lot of the people that run towns and cities uh because it really is a popularity contest how people Ah. get put in place it's really because there's no prerequisites it's not like you need a degree or you need job experience you just need just need votes so you know that was eye-opening too to see how things work behind the scenes to see how public works were uh and how you know cities really are run and come together and it's kind of scary sometimes but (laughs) like it's uh but it's been an amazing journey and watching um things come together and I realized that things take time because you're thinking about the future, you're sure. thinking about, you know, smart cities, you're thinking about sensors, you're thinking about the way you you live your life every day, the way you, you know, you go to work, the way you go to school, you know, and and data collection and everything else and privacy issues and 
all those things, and, you know, and the way safety, you know, the way you light your road, the way you, if there's an emergency, how do you get out of there? The way, you know, you can give an emergency uh, blast to someone in an area. You know, I mean, there's so many different uh, uses, you know, that are uh, pushing us into the future, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing to try to uh, be on the forefront of that, you know, and hopefully, you know, it's not a technology that's, uh, you know, before your time, you know, you never want to be before your time. But I think it's it's one of those things that's right on time. It's just it's, uh, it's everything's always about buy in from everybody, you know. Well, along with the green space that you're involved in, <clears throat> assisting um, other entrepreneurs, uh, you're also the president of the Chicago NFL alumni chapter. Yes. So, Talk to us a little bit about that. So, uh, you know, it's really about getting players together, uh, helping them to uh, be impactful in the, in the communities that we serve, right? Not just lip service, actually going to uh, actual communities. Uh, people of Chicago, there are people on the South side and the West side, do not be afraid, come on down, let's help. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, they watch the news, they are afraid, you know, they, you know, it's kind of this stereotype, this, that, and the other. But I think for those that want to complain, do something, right? Make sure you show up. Make sure that you have resources where you, you can come out and be impactful to the kids. You know, it may not be for the adults, but certainly for the kids and, and making sure that you're there and you provide some hope. So it's trying to get players together, keep them together, uh, let them know about their resources. Mm -hmm. uh, most importantly, too, right? Because players don't know about resources. They don't know about, uh, you know, it's, Many times I've talked to players, they didn't know about their 401ks. They didn't know about their pensions because they thought they had to be three years or four years or five years or whatever the case may be. And let them know about the trust and the PA. And, you know, that over the years, things have kind of shifted so much. And it's kind of like, where are all these things coming from? So I, sure. I try to be someone that researches and tries to stay on top of knowing what's going on and, and how players can get help and how players can get money. And, do everything like the trust, like, you know, like going back to school, like mm -hmm. they provide money for you to go back to school. So that was, that was another one of those big things that, you know, was important to me, uh, was the school being school being paid for, you know, uh, sometimes that's a deterrent to people, right. obviously, you know, putting a little down myself, you know, skin in the game, but okay. you know, with the majority of it being handled, you know, from resources that were already set in place from the collective bargaining bargaining agreement. So I think if you don't use these resources, they go away. You know, budgets don't stay forever. Uh, they feel like, well, they're not using it, then the money will go somewhere else. So that's why mm. I always encourage players to take advantage of these things. Right. Take care of your health, take care of your, you know, take care of all these things. But some players, you know, I, like we talk about college, they leave the game bitter right. and they don't want anything to do with it, to which I understand it's a nasty business at times and it isn't always friendly. But, you know, there's there are resources there uh, to take advantage of, you know, and unfortunately, you know, sometimes you you're out. You may not qualify, but sometimes you do. You know, mm -hmm. and it's it's amazing some of the stuff that's available now to take advantage of. So please, please take advantage of. I will also put a link to the uh, the Pleasure Association and also to the uh, the alumni website as well in, in the description. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things I want to talk to you about, well, and I mentioned this in the beginning in your intro, was the fact that you are part of the NFL Fashion Police. Um, <laughs> I kind of joked around by that, but that's actually a true joke. Now, that, that's not the exact title, but that's what a lot of folks in the NFL call what you do. Can you explain to the folks what the being the NFL fashion police is about. So uh, last year I had the privilege of uh, becoming an NFL uniform inspector for the, That's the real home games. That's the real name. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, so being able to, uh, you know, make sure everybody's in compliance. A lot of people don't know that, you know, the NFL uniform, the NFL license, you know, licenses that out, uh, you know, to different companies, uh, apparel, all that stuff. So, you know, you know, if you didn't pay, you know, to be to have your logo on the field, you know, you need to get off. So, uh, you know, so making sure, you know, the socks are right, the uniform is right, the cleats are right, the visor is right, you know, um, 
everything is supposed to your pads are in everything's supposed to be in compliance and you know people you know they kind of give you a bad rap but i'm actually not responsible for any fines you know you just <laughs> report it you know uh, but i feel like you know i feel like more like a financial advisor i'm trying to save you money I tell you, <laughs> exactly you need to get your stuff together well and, you and i, I guess i pay I 10 or fifteen thousand dollars there you go and, and i don't think folks understand this but you know if your socks aren't pulled all the way up or if your shirt is untucked you get fined for that yeah yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, and it's, it's a lot of communication. And I think last year was my first year. So it was, and it was crazy because you had COVID. So it was like, I can't, I'm not supposed to talk to play. I'm not supposed to do it. It was like kind of <laughs> trial by fire, learning on the run. And, and it was crazy too, because there was no one in the stands. Oh. So for, I think for that first two games, there was no crowd noise. And I don't know if you've ever been to a little league game at a park. <laughs> That's what it was like with some oh really big God. ass kids. Wow. So they were really hilarious. fast, big ass kids. But <laughs> it was it was uh it was amazing to see all the behind the scenes too, right? So you see all the different jobs and careers that go on. You got security, mm -hmm. you got, you know, everybody that's working in cameras, you know, everybody that's, you know, stadium. I, and seeing all that behind the scenes stuff you you see on game day as a player, but you don't see. Right. And it was and it was really amazing too that kids need to know about all these opportunities and careers exactly. outside, outside of being a of player. Exactly. exactly. Because you know, you, as a player, you're only a product, and once you're used up, you're gone. You know, exactly. but it, you know, you can work the camera if you can do electric, if you can do you know construction, if you can do marketing, if you can do journalism, if you can. There's all these different jobs all over the stadium that uh, you can be a part of, you know, and you don't have to sit in the ice tub the next day after, you know. <laughs> Which is so, very good. So it's, it, it's, it's been really amazing, you know, and it, it's also a great way to watch, uh, watch a game. So, uh, <laughs> but it, it was really cool, really getting to see some players play last year live and in person, you know, not having any distractions around you because there's no crowd. Sure. You know, sure. and there's not sure. all these other people on the field walking around. So it was a it was a stark contrast, uh, you know, with the preseason game, walking in there and seeing all the fans and all the people right. everywhere. You know, it was just it was kind of crazy uh, how everything was just just different, you know. <laughs> so but it was cool. And I think for the second game, we had an air and water show. So you had jets flying all over, wow. all over the uh, <laughs> all over the stadium. Well, You've had a, an amazing journey. We're, we're, we're going to kind of wind down. You've been very gracious with your time. I do appreciate that. But you, you've been on this amazing journey, Corey. And, I mean, talking about growing up on the south side of Chicago, going to Morgan Park, um, you know. Oh, we haven't even scratched surfaces, but. <laughs> but, no, but, 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 but. But this is something that I think is, is great because, I mean, a lot of folks and – you know, for all intents and purposes, we, we kind of grew up in the same area, but a lot of folks don't have these opportunities, right? No. But you've taken no. advantage of that. And, and I think that's that's really great because it's almost like a funnel, right? I mean, the opportunities are more, more, more and more rare. And then all of a sudden, it takes someone with the understanding the support to actually take advantage of these yeah. opportunities. And, and I think you've done that throughout your career, college, professionally, afterward. Um, I want to talk about two things and then, you know, we, we, we wind down, but through all these experience, talk to us a little bit about kind of what you've learned about leadership. And then also talk a little bit about kind of being involved in different cultures, right? So, you, as a freshman, <laughs> there's a certain type of culture there at Notre Dame. Then all of a sudden, there's another one. Then a month later, there's another, there's another, and another one. And then the NFL, there's different. I mean, talk to us a little bit about that and kind of making that transition because I think that's important. I mean, a lot of folks are, are moving from jobs to jobs, and it, it can be really challenging. I mean, yeah. how did you work through that? So I think from a leadership standpoint, uh, the first thing you learn is 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 action. Leadership is about action and showing up, right? Because I can 
I can do rah rah speeches and I can I can virtue signal sig virtue signaling. Yes, I can do all that and make it look good, but if I never do anything about it, then am I a real leader? You know, am okay. I just you know just someone posing and you know trying to look good? So I think from a just it's just showing up. And I felt that, you know, every time I came home from college, you know, to back to my high school or or to go talk to some kids, you know, when I got to the league, I think it was always about building a bridge and helping others come along with me. Right. Of giving them that encouragement, because that's something I would have wanted uh, when I was in their shoes of of someone telling you, yeah, you, it's possible. You know, it may you may or may not have the talent or it may, you know, you may get injured, you, whatever the case may be, but you can be something. You can do mm -hmm. something, you know, like, it, it, you know, it's just trying to open up your eyes and, and, you know, to the world and make sure that you see something else. And I think that's what's some, most important is you, is you get to see something else and you get to know that there's another world out here for you, but you got to fight for it. Right. You got to be willing to, to get it, you, you know, and just understand you talk about the culture in Notre Dame and, you know, my freshman year of, I understood that there was wealth there. I understood that, you know, there was a, another game, but I'm 17. So I didn't really fully understand how to, how to grasp, you know, that, you know, like your, your dad owns Mars or uh, three fifths of the ocean, you know, it's like, it's, it's a whole nother ball game, right. you know, and I, I just, you know, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't really grasp that. But I, I, but I also understood that you're rubbing shoulders with people that <laughs> have had way bigger opportunities than you sure. had in your life. So don't mess this up, right? right? And just continue to fight through it. But I, I just always kept that in my mind of being grateful and just understanding it doesn't have to be me. You know, mm -hmm. it could be somebody else. I remember being in a camp. Uh, it was actually a Notre Dame camp. It was a one day camp. Came in. This was right before they. I think they offered me that day. Okay. And it was one of the guys in our linebacker line who was going through drills. I mean, this guy is he's going 110 percent. He's just he's he's dogging it. He's working it. And and I remember thinking with all that effort, like you could just see he didn't have that extra gear, but he was working his ass off. He was doing everything he was supposed to do. And that was a further reminder in life, even early seeing that. And I often I often remind myself about that is you can work hard, but it may not work out. So right. it's like, you don't, I don't sell dreams and tell people just work hard and it'll work out because that's not necessarily true. Mm. You know, it just, it just may not be there, you know? And I, I think like, it's just a blessing to be, to have, you know, success that I've had in my life through the ups and downs. I think it's all been a blessing because it's all lessons that I can tell again to somebody and say, look, you don't want to go down this path. You right. don't want to make that decision or, you know, I've been there and comfort somebody and be able to, to talk about things. But I think, you know, that's what real leadership is about is being able to translate things and not keep it to yourself is make sure that everybody else around you eats. I want everybody around me to win. You know, <laughs> I might do the compare and contrast thing, but that's, that's, that's personal me being competitive with me, right. but I'm not going to tear anybody else down. Right. I want every last person around me to win, you know, why do you want to be around a loser? You know, or why do you want to have a loser mentality? Not me. I don't want to be around it, you know, because I've seen it enough. You've had teammates who who do just enough, who had a loser mentality that they don't care. And to me, I don't want to be around that. It's negative energy. It's, it's everything that's, I don't want to be around that. So, you know, <laughs> just get it away from me. Mm. Corey, this has been great, man. This is, I could kind of talk to you all night. I had a chance to learn so much. I, I appreciate that. A uh, couple things. I'll be co-hosting with Chris Eccles, the new Notre Dame um, PA announcer, the 2021 Rackney Award celebration on Friday, September 24th at Ooh. 1130 at the Chicago Sports Museum in the Water Tower. And of course, parking is free. We'll be honoring, in honor of Newt Rackney, we'll be honoring uh, football, uh, College Football Hall of Famer and Super Bowl winner, Ann Taylor. Uh, Notre Dame and Chicago Bear great and former Supreme Court Justice Bob Thomas, um, ND legend and manager of the band Chicago, Peter Chivarelli. You know the, the Chivarelli? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. We're going to be honoring him. Um, Notre Dame women's basketball star and 
military veteran, Danielle Green, who is really from Chicago, another public school alum. She has, she has an amazing story. Um, former Wisconsin head coach and athletic director and amazing individual, Barry Alvarez, and many more. If you can't make it, check out our live stream and you can get that information at rockneysociety.org. Uh, as I mentioned, show. Corey, this has been great, man. This, is, this has been terrific. And thank you for kind of going in depth with kind of your journey. Um, it wasn't the, the perfect journey by any means, but I think we've learned what your really kind of biggest asset is. And I think that's resilience. Right. I mean, I'm not right. even talking about kind of coming from where you came from, but just kind of going through four coaches in four years or five years and going through adversity there, having a chance to spend some time on several NFL teams and then take advantage of those opportunities, taking going back to school, seeing that there's more out there, starting um, being involved in assisting other entrepreneurs to be successful. I mean, what, what haven't you done? <laughs> well, you know what? It sounds good when you, when you put it like that, but I know that, <laughs> I know that, I know for me, God willing, the journey is just beginning. So I'm just I'm trying to try to be like you when I grow up, you know? Just... Wow. Please. You're so bad. <laughs> um, I like to thank everyone watching and listening to this episode of the Zorge podcast, conversations with leaders and legends. This podcast, along with our other podcasts, are available at my YouTube page at youtube.com slash chriszorch50, as well as on Apple, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the bell to be notified when we bring you new content. Also, check out the description below. As I mentioned before, we're, we're going to have um, Corey's uh, information there, but also... We also have some amazing books by individuals like Joe Montana, Lou Holtz, Jerome Bettis, folks who've been on the podcast, but they've uh, had a chance to kind of talk about their books and their life journeys as well. This has been great, man. This, is, this has been great. Please come back because I want to hear more about what you're doing and um, kind of really understanding kind of who, or, or I'm sorry, how you became the person you are because that's it's, it's it's an amazing story and i look forward to hopefully you putting together a book so so we, we can share it with the world mm, mm. something to think about I've, I've got like 30 different journals that i filled up with thoughts and everything that's even better see if you're, I, I, just, just give it to a give, give it to an editor and you'll be set you know you know the crazy thing about this is as soon as you get off the podcast you think about 50 interesting stories and all the stuff right. I've written down right. and you know it all comes together it's kind of when you're talking but I mean it's I'm going to be thinking about things all night like nah, I should have told that story I should have told this but you know well, we have time constraints I love that you know, I talk about the time I saw Chris Zorich talk to 50,000 fans at Soldier Field no, that's just great. a few weeks ago <laughs> yeah right that was that was fun great it's been great man I let you promise me you'll come back we got oh absolutely more to talk. okay absolutely absolutely so we, at least we, we can do this we haven't talked about nerd agencies or anything else like that. And we've got a ton of stuff we can talk about. But, Corey, it's been great. I, I do, do appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate you and this platform. You know, I, I know it's a, I'm getting in early, you know, because after a while, you know, you, <laughs> people blow up. You can't even get a, oh, you, you won't be returning phone calls and emails. But I'll be, be like, nice. I was on the show. Be I can nice. tell my grandkids, I was on the show. <laughs> Trust me, I was on the show. All right, Corey. Go Irish, man. Go Irish, man.